introduce to our speaker today. Um, he's from CS. I know. Sorry, from the uh, Fire oh. Investigations Unit, and um, he's really uh, got a fantastic uh, show for us tonight. So, uh, without more ado, I'll pass you on to Mark Ross and the video. <laughs> It's just YouTube, you think? <laughs> Why are we doing that again? <laughs> Well, my name's Mark, and that's just to give you an idea of the uh, kind of things we're talking about. That's the glamorous side of fire investigation, but the reality is something different. I'm going to try and explain to you a bit about what I do and how I go about it. Well, this is me. Um, I work for the London Fire Brigade. I've been investigating fires since uh, 1996, uh, on and off, and I've been in the brigade for... Uh, I mean, 21 years now, I think. Uh, and I work in London. In London, we have uh, three offices, 28 full time investigators. We usually have uh, seven on duty at any one time. Tonight, there's four, and one of them's here, so uh, there's three. Uh, we've got a couple of dogs, they are accelerant dogs, and they sniff out um, ignitable liquids, hydrocarbon based liquids, in an attempt to catch arsonists. But um, I'm going to explain to you a little bit about what I do. What is fire? Well, this is quite an interesting thing because um, most of our senior guys, the older officers, you could get them up in court and uh, the defence barracks could build them up. You've been in 28 years, you've done this, you've done that. Um, can you tell me what fire is? And they couldn't answer it. And their, their evidence would be shot down in flames. So as an investigator, I need to have a level to give the expertise, palm. Yeah. if you like. <laughs> And I've got a bit of have a stab at some definition so that people think, at least I appear I know what I'm talking about. Does anyone like to give me an idea, a definition of what they think fire is? Combustion. Sorry? An event of combustion. Yeah. But um, when you eat, that's combustion. Did you know that? So is that fire? So that's part of it. Anyone else want to have a go? No? I'll show you what um, the textbook definition is. Fire is a rapid oxidation reaction leading to the evolution of heat and light in varying temperatures. That's good, isn't it? How yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Cool. That was worth coming out for. <laughs> yeah, if, I, uh, if I read that out to your average jury, um, especially at some of the local courts around here, they probably wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm a local resident. <laughs> <laughs> knowing the scientific details, I need to be able to explain. In court, I'm like a teacher. I have to teach people about what I do. So I would explain that as a, it's a chemical reaction involving a fuel and oxygen. And when they mix, they give off heat and light in varying intensity. It's different amounts. So that's the flame. We see as the flame. Because rust is an oxidation reaction. I mean, that's not very interesting, is it rust? <laughs> but it doesn't give off heat and light. So that's the difference. So that's fire, OK? <clears throat> And this is how fire works. This is a scientific bit. We'll get this over with and then we'll show you something interesting. If this is a block of wood, a block of fuel, yeah? <coughs> now, to ignite that fuel, what I have to do, I have to impart energy into the block with the form of heat, maybe a match or something like that. And I heat up the fuel source, and what I'm doing, I'm imparting heat energy into the molecular structure of the fuel. Hopefully, if I've got enough energy, it's going to break down the molecular bonds of the big solid structure of fuel and allow the, uh, the molecules to break up into smaller, more volatile molecules. And they become like a, almost like a white gas. We call it off-gassing or gassing off. That's what's going to burn. It's not the solid. Fire's always a gas phase reaction. So it's either the vapour from a liquid or the gas that's already a gas at room temperature or a gas that's been pyrolyzed by heating a solid object. The, uh, it mixes with air. And in the right proportions, we'll get a flame. That's the chemical reaction. Well, there's probably there's hundreds of different chemical reactions going on in the flame. It's quite complicated. 
But the interesting thing about fire, I mean, when I was at school, I didn't really like chemistry, to be honest. I love it now, but um, the chemistry teacher would get two chemicals, mix them together, and they'd turn blue. Wow, you know, really interesting. But <laughs> I couldn't see the point in that. The difference with fire it is a chemical reaction, but it's what we call a chain reaction. It runs away of itself. Because if you lit and it stops straight away, you'd never get a fire growing and developing. But with, with fire, so if I've got, let me put some figures, let's say I'm putting two and a half kilowatts of heat energy, just for example, into this plume. See these arrows pointing down? What happens is it radiates heat back onto the fuel. I'm maybe getting 10 kilowatts out of there, so it's acting like an amplifier. Now for every 10 degrees centigrade rise in temperature, the reaction rate doubles. So you can imagine the sort of temperatures involved in fire are extremely high, 800 degrees C, 1000 degrees C, flame temperatures is about 800, so that chemical reaction is rocketing away. It just gets faster and bigger and hotter, well, not necessarily hotter, but until it either runs out of fuel, runs out of oxygen, or we come along and, and put it out mm. one way or another. Mm. This is, um, if you go back to school, the triangle of fire, our suppression guys, the firefighters, they use this as a... Um, Simple guide, put a fire out. If I take away any one of three, three, fire can't exist. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but if I take away fuel, we've got no fuel, so take the heat out, the fire can't exist. But um, also, um, where's our, uh, the guy who was there, firefighter? Oh, there he is. You'll understand this one. Senior officers? Yeah? The problem is when they get them at jobs, everything burns down. So if we can get rid of them, we can get rid of them. <laughs> Anyway, as an investigator, what I try and do is I try and look, in simple terms, how the fire spread, and then I'm going to try and track that back, like a map, you know, to try and find where that fire started. And um, I'm going to look at the signs and the symptoms and stuff that's fire's mm -hmm. caused. Now, fire spreads in three ways. Um, conduction, that's like electricity. Uh, travelling along the wire. It's the same principle. Um, <coughs> molecules vibrating, passing their energy along. I'll give you an example of uh, conductive spread. So if we're in this building and I have a, a fire here and a steel, maybe an RSJ, a roll steel joist running along and I have a combustible, some fuel at the other end, it's possible that I could heat that steel up enough to ignite a fuel package down at the other end of it. Now, to an untrained eye, it could look like you've got two seats of fire, maybe a deliberate fire, someone's come in and set two different seats, but it could just be conduction. Or through a wall, a thin wall, you can get uh, combustibles ignite in one side of the wall when there's a fire on the other. It's not all that important for us, really, as a fire method of fire spread, but um, it's a bit of interest. Can Dave, can I get, grab you a minute as a volunteer? <laughs> if you could just... Stand in, we've got to stop that candle blowing, let it stop blowing about. And all I want you to do is just lower your hand over until you just feel it's warm, just slightly warm, not too far. The last guy I did this with a rugged blow and he, he burnt his hand. I thought you're probably going to feel it about there. Okay, now if you if you look at the distance, now if you come in from the side until you feel the same temperature on your hand. Now you can literally almost touch it. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> He's a, a stump man in his spare time. Um, <laughs> Have you already done first aid? <laughs> Now what he's developed, what, what he's demonstrated there is the other two methods of fire spread. Now the first one is, um, oh, what have I done? Sorry. Press the wrong button on the Convection. This is convection. It can happen in a liquid or a gas, and at the early stages of fire, convection is the main form of fire spread. Now, as a fire burns, what it does, it draws cold air into the bottom, it trains it in, and it pushes the plume up, and the hot gases and smoke rise to the ceiling. That's a convective current. And then as it hits the ceiling, it will start to spread out, almost like a bath filling upside down. At a later stage in the fire, radiation takes over. Now radiation is like the sun. It's electromagnetic radiation that travels in straight lines in all directions. But it's very distant dependence. So that's why you could get very close. That's radiation. The importance of that I'll show you later. But the interesting thing is it, it, it works on what we call the inverse square law. So if I hold my hand here and I'm getting 10 kilowatts of heat flux on my hand, 
If I double the distance, it doesn't go down to five, it goes down to two and a half. So it's very de distance dependent. So if I look at a fire and I can see when the damage has happened because of the direction it's occurred in, you know, and you could say I've got a waste bin of light here, this is how it started, and I dropped a cigarette in there, it started and it's caught that table of light. Well, I know it, there's not enough radiant heat flux in that waste bin to set that table of light because of the distance. So it's another way we look at things. So that's how fire spreads. <coughs> We follow what's known as the scientific or systematic method, and uh, this is really boring, so I always forget, but it doesn't mean I have to wear a white coat and a little beard, it just means it's a logical approach. And um, what we do, we recognise the need, there's been a problem, there's been a fire. Uh, we find a problem, I need to know how it starts, so I'm going to collect data. And that data can be looking at the fire scene, talking to witnesses, CCTV, previous experience, history, from everywhere. Uh, and I always say there's no such thing as bad data. It might be irrelevant, but if I don't find it out, I can't make that decision. You know, sometimes people lying to you is some of the best information you can have. And once you can pin them down to that lie, then, you know, and they're telling you things that can't possibly happen, they're going to have to start backpedaling, telling more lies, and then really, you know, you've, you've got them. So, uh, a lie is a pretty good bit of data. <laughs> so, uh, you sound like you know about that. <laughs> That's a company I keep. Oh, <laughs> Once I've got that data, I think I've got, I'm going to analyse it. So I'm going to look at it and think, um, oh, I know what's happened. This has gone on, that's gone on. That's what, from what I've found. Then I'm going to develop a hypothesis. Think, oh, what's happened? This is how it started. I might have more than one. It might be two, three, four. I might never get a hypothesis. I might never get a cause. If I do get a cause, I'm going to test it. Now, testing it can be as simple as my previous knowledge and experience, or looking in textbooks, or... Like the King's Crossfire, you know, a third scale full reconstruction of the elevator, of the uh, escalators. Or a full crime scene reconstruction. So, testing is not, you know, a, a fixed thing. But um, hopefully at the end of that, I'm going to come out with one scenario that will work with the, the data I've got. Ruling out all the others. Now, the hardest thing for an investigator is to get an undetermined. It's, you know, you get your first one. When you first start... Hmm. The, fault with, the problem with new investigators is they're overconfident and uh, they may be at an incident and the you know, people outside say, oh, the old boy was always smoking, he's always catching things alight and uh, caught himself alight. Obviously he's been drunk like most of the people here and he's falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so the problem is in, in their head now they've got that as a cause and when they go into the scene, the data they get, they will try and unconsciously twist to fit what they think has mm. happened and that's a mistake all investigators can make but we're evidence-led and we try not to go down that path I mean many years ago this did happen to one of our investigators uh, they went to a scene it was a fatal old boy uh, another crew turned up to help he said don't need it accidental I'm smoking eventually when a crime scene manager got there they rolled the body over he had a knife in it. <laughs> now, he may have been unfortunate, just fallen over onto it, but he, does, he must have fallen several times because it was several times. <laughs> so, and he was an experienced investigator, and you know, you can, we all make mistakes. But, um, so that's why we try and follow this methodology. Mm. Now this is, um, this is why I joined the fire brigade. I joined for the excitement to put out fires. It, it's... I can't tell you what it's like going into a, a building. It, it's not, well, it can be scary, but it's not because you're pumped full of adrenaline as a young man. It's just great, you know, it's fantastic. It's something I never thought I'd imagine. I'd imagine. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll come on to that. Bordering on. This, um, this isn't a burning cross, by the way, it's a CCTV camera. This was uh, in Hackney. Anyone know Hackney at all? Uh, this was um, an old shop in. Uh, Amherst Road, shop and dwellings, and um, I'll carry on show you. You know, it is fantastic. It's amazing to watch. This was like the Blitz this fire. There were all these uh, brands, flying brands, went everywhere. They caused loads of secondary fires in the narrow way, uh, where the market is. There was an old vagrant in his sleeping bag, caught him alight. Well, his sleeping bag alight. Anyway, we had to put him out <laughs> to laugh, but oh. it was all his belongings, you know. It, you have to, we have a if you like, they, they, you're not laughing at them, you have to laugh at things mm. because honestly, it, it it might if you didn't, it mm. would destroy you sometimes. Mm. So it's, it's a morbid sense of humour, if you like, mm. but it's a way of coping. So. Mm. 
and the doorway, you can't see it, but the doorway to, church, to the church is here. And about this time, another tramp came out of the church with a sleeping bag. He'd been in there, in that porch all the time, hiding, because he thought we were going to blame him for the fire. And he only just got out before it broke through. And the, the vicar of the, uh, of the Methodist church, I think, let him sleep there. He knew he stayed there. He'd always lived there in the porch. And uh, he had a lucky escape. I couldn't believe it. He came walked out alive. It was like a miracle. But there you go. We see some strange things. Mark, do you know you talked about copper in that fire? Was yeah. it the colour of the fire that told you it was copper or what? No, I just knew the roof was copper. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's, um, it's interesting, Ralph, because copper has a very high melting point, and usually by the time it gets to that in a fire, we see it's oxidised and it becomes fire and breaks. It doesn't often have a quick enough build up for it to melt, but in this case, it was such a high temperature fire on that roof that it melted the copper and I saw it dripping on the same time seen it. So for me, it'd be nanorack. And... <laughs> but that church, you know, I, I love all this, but. I, to be honest, the first time I got in a fire investigation, I was at a job in Stratford. Uh, it was in the middle of winter, and we were having a water fight. And uh, <laughs> the fire was almost out, and uh, the old guy, Tom, who was, I was the buck, the new bloke, and he sprayed my back. And I, I, found, well, I found a little pile of embers, and I was standing on it, keeping warm, and I'd seen him across the other side of the building, and I'd soaked him. I was you know, standing there laughing away, and he crept round me with a 70mm jet behind me, nearly knocked me over in the fire. He soaked me, and uh, my tunic froze on my back. I remember sitting down in the fire engine with the tunic, it was solid, it was going like that. Was <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, after the fire was out, I remember sort of feeling uh, like, disappointed that there wasn't more to do. And um, so I wanted to continue. Now, there must be something more, and that's where I first got into fire this place, and that was uh, many years back. But, um, this is what I'm about. That's where that fire started. It's a small area of origin. So from that church, completely down to the ground almost, this is what I'm looking for. And some kids got in, they peeled up the copper eaves at ground level, peeled it up, shoved some paper in, went up the eaves, hit the inside, hit a small flat roof, spread into the main structure of the church, and uh, they lost the building. And they had no, they self-insured the Methodist church on this, so it was a costly uh, night for them, I'm afraid. But that's what I'm about as a fire investigator. Now, um, I'll tell you what, let me show you a little bit of video before we come here first. Has anyone heard the term flashover? Yeah. I'm going to um, I'm going to show you a bit of video. I'll find somewhere I'll go up. Let's uh, I'm going to explain to you what a flashover is. Um, is it the same as backdraft? No, completely different. <laughs> is it exactly the opposite? <laughs> You've got no vacancies then. Colin will help you, won't you, Colin? <laughs> right, flashover is a stage in a fire. And the easiest way to explain it, it's when you have a fire in a room and it then becomes a room on fire. Now, the one I'm going to show you here is not... Um, oh, no, sorry. Where's the guy? Thank you, right, again. I really do want to show you this, so I'm going to persist. Right, the ignition source is under the tree. That's a normal Christmas tree. Now imagine um, Dave has come home from the Rotary meeting on a Friday night, asleep in his chair. If you look at the timing, had a few drinks. I'll play it a couple of times. Just wanted to watch it first and, and be aware of the timing. There's nothing been introduced into that room. It's just a normal domestic compartment. The difference is it's got an open front, so it's going to take longer, if anything, for that to build up. So we're approaching complete room involvement. It flashes over at 44 seconds, really. That's what we call 
I mean, when you actually call the flesh out, it's quite hard um, to define. But mm -hmm. now what I'll do, we'll run through it again, and I'll explain to you what's going on. Right, ignition source under the tree. Now that tree has got a lot of energy, a lot of resin in there, and it's a couple of weeks old after Christmas, so it's going to go like a rocket. But if you look at the chair arms uh, and up here on this table, this is convection, all right, at the moment. Now as it starts to spread out and fill up, radiation takes over. And you, if you look here, see this white gas coming off of here, and here, if you watch this space here by the lamp, that will catch a light without any flame touching it, and that's radiation heating up the fuel packages. Here it goes, uh, in a minute now. And it reaches what we call its spontaneous ignition temperature. Yeah? And if you look at the rabbit's ears, can you see the gas coming off there? That's all flammable, it's just not hot enough to react yet. When it reaches the correct temperature, it will burst into flames without any flame contact. So what was go. the ignition point, a 40 plug? Uh, it could have been maybe, a, a, it, w it was an electronic match, but it could have been a kid matches, you know, we were just trying to um, Oh, I'm with you. Illustrate some sort of uh, scenario. So, if it was in this room, uh, I'll try and put some figures on it. If we had a fire here, first off, the plume would go up as we talked, hit the ceiling, start to spread out. Now, we need about ceiling temperature of about 600 degrees C to, minimum to achieve flashover, and a radiant heat flux of 20 kilowatts a square meter onto the flammable items. Now, I'll be all right, as I've got my own defence system, and some of you ladies would go burst into flames straight away. Um, so if I try and, uh, if we think the hottest day of the year, okay, when most people would burn in about 20 minutes, if we um, think of the sun, it's putting down about one kilowatt a square metre. An average firefighter uh, gets about two and a half kilowatts a square metre when he's firefighting. You get up to 10 kilowatts a square metre, you're going to get burnt instantly, instant pain. So 20 kilowatts is a lot of energy, but as you can see, the normal uh, compartment fire, there's plenty of energy in there. Your average room, and an average house if there is such a thing, to uh, bring it to flash over, we need about a megawatt or less of heat energy, and that's an armchair, something like that. So it's not a lot. <coughs> Backdraft is a different scenario where a room's bottled up, there's no ventilation, it fills up with all those combustion products, so it's a very smoky filled room, but it's hot. And maybe your firefighter comes along, opens the door, lets oxygen in, and that smoke explodes. Oh, okay. And that's a smoke explosion in the back door. Okay. Right, let's carry on. Have a look at these. Now, if I was um, to ask, say you're walking down up into the high street, and you saw that, and I asked you to describe it, okay? And then, I'm old, next week, you're walking down there, and you saw that, and I asked you to describe it. You probably wouldn't be able to tell much difference between the two. But there is a difference, and uh, it's not visual. I'll show you what it is. That's the time from ignition to flashover. So when we saw that flashover occur, so when the fire was first ignited. And the difference is the time. Now, these two compartments we had exactly the same fuel in. It was the same ventilation conditions. I know, because I set lights on. There was one thing different caused it to reach flash over that much quicker. And there's a lot of mess involved. Does anyone have a guess what it could have been? One thing different. Oxygen? No, there was the same amount of ventilation. No, exactly the same furniture. One thing was added. You had two matches. <laughs> yeah, sorry, who was that? Accelerant. Excellent, that's exactly what it was. The fire on your right was accelerated. An ignitable liquid, in this case it was lamp. Uh, lamp uh, oil was introduced in that compartment. Now, there's lots of mess about accelerants. You'll hear firemen at uh, jobs say, oh, it, it must have been an accelerant used, it was a really hot fire. You think yourself, I've never seen a coal break, but <laughs> it's, you know, people get carried away. But from my point of view, that's all an accelerant will do. It, if I had a graph, it will bring the gra time of the graph down from ignition to flashover. Now, in the States, there's They've got such a variety of investigators. They've got some of the best in the world and some of the worst in the world. And people are still going to prison for myths based on the use of accelerants. It must be an accelerant because the concrete's full, because the, the timber's burned down, because the hot fire was hot and these have been passed from father to son with no scientific background in the small towns and people go to prison and stuff like that still to this day. 
But they've also got some of the best investigators in the world. In the UK this doesn't happen because we've had the luxury of not working on myths, we work on scientific data. But as an investigator to me, that's what Excel does. Flame temperature will be the same, about 800 degrees C, a turbulent flame. It's, um, anyone like to give me a definition of an accelerant? No. Petrol can be used as an accelerant. Gas. Something to do with speeding up the process. Very good. You know too much. <laughs> <laughs> so that goes. Yeah. And, and, and taught me everything I know. This lady here. Where were you Tuesday night? <laughs> That's very, very good. Now this is where the police get mixed up a lot. An accelerant is not the liquid, it's how it's used. So a good definition is this. A fuel or oxidizer, often an ignitable liquid, but not always. And it's used to initiate, increase the growth or spread of a fire. So it's how you use it. So if I've got a fire in a garage next to your house and you keep petrol lawnmower in there and a petrol can, it's involved in the fire. It has accelerated that fire, but it's not an accelerant. However, if I've gone out and spread it around the garage in an attempt to spread the fire, then it's been used as an accelerant. And the police get terribly mixed up with this. So we try not to use this terminology because it confuses them. The typical reaction I get from, is there any police officers here? And try police officers? Nope. Oh, gone. Um, that's all right. I can really you say what you like. <laughs> they, they typically think as an accelerant, as petrol. And quite often you'll get the same CID will come up to me and say, is there any accelerant being used? And what they mean, you know, well, is there any petrol, mate? And uh, I'll say no. Next thing I turn around, they've gone. Because they think, Without that, they've got no proof what's not a deliberate fire. We get, we're a long way off that now, it's a lot better now, but that's how it was. And, you know, we had our hang-ups as well. But, um, so it's good to know that definition. But um, I'll tell you what, before we go any further, let me show you some stuff. Let me show you. This is got, do you know, arson in the UK is uh, really, really under-reported. The, the detection rate of arson was, uh, now detection doesn't mean prosecution. Mm. That just means detection was about set at about six percent. But when we looked at the actual reported arsons and we worked it out, it's more like 0.01 percent. It's wow. terrible. And um, you know, there's some great stuff about. It. If anyone's thinking of a change of career, arsonist is good because you're very unlikely to get caught. There's some great. This is a. This is from uh, Morrison's fire starter matches. Little junior arsonist kit. You can go and get them. They're really good. I recommend them. <laughs> On pound fifty nine. They're little. Um, Wax candles with match heads, just strike them, throw them in a car, whatever way it goes. I'll never find that. So uh, they're good. That's a good kit, you know, for an arsonist. Um, it's 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 weird because when I go, I'll go shopping with my wife. She's looking at e numbers to stop my little girl climbing the walls. I'm looking to see if it burns. This is pretty good. This stuff. Let's, um, let's try this. This is good. I'm not, I can't do anything too spectacular because obviously I'll burn a building down. But um, <laughs> if this bag here catches light, please just let me run out first and then you'll follow me. <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, you know, hand cleaner in vogue at the moment with swine flu. This is a great accelerant. But, um, can you see it's got a blue flame? Yeah. That's alcohol based, yeah. very little carbon content. Now, with that flame, I could literally touch that because there's very little radiant heat. It's the glowing carbon that gives you the radiant heat flux. Mm. But the temperature of that flame is probably about 2,000 degrees C, so I can nearly touch it. If I did, I'd know all about it, so I don't. But, um, you know, there's stuff that burns ev everywhere. Uh, what's uh, the main cause of fire? Anyone know? Um, so there's no trace on that. If you were to set the question, like, there's no trace. Uh, very difficult to pick it up. Um, I mean, if you're looking for a way to set your house like accidentally make it look good, speak to me afterwards, we can come up. <laughs> 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 we'll have a look at your insurance, make sure it's alright and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards it'll be an easy nick for me. So. <laughs> no, um, it's very difficult to detect. But, you know, in places like, uh, well, last fire we had involving this as an accelerant was at um, a uh, mental health institution. They had it everywhere. It clearly states it's flammable. One of the patients wasn't quite as mental as they thought and they could read, you know, and he, he talked to a place and it burnt out. That wasn't far from me and that was about three months ago. I can't remember exactly where it was. Um, so it's difficult, it's a difficult balance. But um, yeah, what do you think the main cause of fire is? Chip pans. Electrical. A lot of people say electrical, but that's uh, smoking. Smoking. It's gas. 
Children with matching. Very ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, you come up here, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> it's men, women, men, women and children, that's what we always say. So it's people, you know, be it deliberate or accidental. People cause from most fires. And um, they, well, I, we think of fuel in three sort of terms. Uh, animal, vegetable, mineral. You know, you think of um, animal. Is animal good fuel? What do you think? Is it a good fuel or not? Yeah. Yeah, anyone thinks that animal pretty yeah, good fuel, yeah? Yeah. yeah? Do you know, after, most people say that, but I often think, I mean, I, I drive about in the countryside a bit, I've never seen a sheep person. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not so sure. It's, uh, animal's not a particularly good fuel. We're animal, you know, we don't burn very well. Have you heard of spontaneous human combustion? Mm. Right, it's, uh, you know... Is it factual or not? Well, it depends where... Uh, no. <laughs> There's plenty of people who think it's true. We've done lots of research, and what it is, the human body doesn't burn very well. It's very difficult to destroy by fire, so if you've murdered someone, it's not the best way to get rid of them. Now, no, well, it's just not. You know, I'm not, this is just, if I give you any advice, probably that's the one thing to take home to my <laughs> If you have a wick, then the body will burn, uh, renders down the fat, or burn, but with a small flame, a low radiant heat flux. So if I had a body here, it's like, we can try it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but because it's got such a small flame, that body hasn't got enough energy to ignite the chairs just a few feet away. So consequently, when you find someone who's been involved in a fire like that, you may find massive destruction to part of the body, legs, but, and basically surrounding area untouched. And that's where the myth comes from. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that. We've done a lot of research. So, animals, not a good fuel. Um, what about vegetable? Anyone think vegetable is a good fuel? No. no. Well, right. vegetable, what's oil? Where's that from? A lot of people think it's mineral. Well, it's vegetable, it's fossilised plants. You know, when this earth, years ago, was like a giant battery. And the sun charged it up into all those plants, they went into the earth, they fossilised, became oil, and that's, we're a hydrocarbon world, and that's vegetable. Everything in this world runs from hydrocarbons, it's fantastic fuel. Problem is, we're running out, you know, what are we going to do? I'll be out the job, we're going to have to burn, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's... <laughs> yeah, that's it. But, um, vegetables are brilliant fuel. But what about minerals? What would we think of as a mineral? Yeah, metal. Some metals are good, uh, you know, sodium, very reactive, but normal metal still, you know, what about rock doesn't burn? Coal. Coal is uh, fossilised plant again, isn't it? Mm. But, in the right form, you know, this is steel wool. Okay, with a little bit of help from a 9 volt battery, hopefully, if it's not flat, I can get that burning. Let me just, um, so, well, I'll just... You know, just about everything burns eventually. Metal burning from a battery. Yeah? I'll put it out before I set the detectors off. That's just a bit of wire wool. Yep. So, anything in the right form. Now, if I'm a... An, oh, this is great. Look, this is uh, another bit arsonist kit. Odor free white spirits. It's very difficult to pick up. Our dogs can sniff it. I can't. Um, so there's, yeah, that's a complete kit. Actually, th these are for sale with the foyer. <laughs> <laughs> now, your average arsonist in the um, in the UK is there's two types. There's those who care and those who don't care. The ones who care try and mask how they set the fire and make it look accidental. The ones who don't care just dip petrol out, set light to it, and lick it, and hope not to get caught. They're not usually that good, the arsonists in the UK, uh, that we, or they're very good and we don't know and we're not catching them. You know, there is that possibility. But um, what they typically would do is come along, spread some petrol van, ignite it, make it. But they don't really understand fire dynamics. A lot of them, they, the fires don't get away. There's not enough oxygen. There's too much petrol. Or they'll, they'll light it and blow the building up. Unless the wind there. But um, our Greenwatch had a, uh, years ago when I was at Bow, Greenwatch had a job of car light by the canal. They went and put it out. Next day, Redwatch went back to a body in the canal. And they found, hooked it out, the body had burns. It was the owner of the vehicle. He tried to do an insurance job, caught himself a light, jumped in the canal and drowned. So, <laughs> a bad day, crime doesn't pay. But, you know, people don't realise how dangerous petrol is uh, and stuff. Let me show you. This is, imagine this is someone's front room. Um, don't worry, it's not they won't get bang, it'll be a bit of a whoosh or something, hopefully it will. Is that petrol? No, no. 
I can't tell you. Because <laughs> <laughs> you must enjoy this at home. That was a left of fear. No, I, I can probably trust you. But, um, if it was something very reactive, it would probably blow up and I'd probably ruin the site of the front row. But um, <laughs> this is uh, not that So if this is your front room and the arsonist has put a bit of gear in it, that's what's going to happen, yeah? And hopefully he's still in there, you know. And what will happen, that momentary flux of flame will go around him, he'll interact with the flame. Now he may have no visible signs of burns on him, but if we seize his clothing, chances are we've got liquid on him that we can trace. And we've also got what we call flame wash mm. on his clothing, you can see under a microscope. Or we may have some hairs burnt on his hands, <coughs> on his eyebrows, so it's very difficult for me to light a pool of ignitable liquid or vapour above it without some form of uh, contact with the flame. So that's, you know, one of the ways we, we look at it. But, um, are you saying we should all use a fuse? We call it a trailer. I'll demonstrate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that, that would be the, uh, the chosen method. I'll show you. Let me say And let's see. Yeah, let's test your fire. May science. I ask a question, please? Of course. Is, is it another? Uh, anyone else want to ask it? Phone call. <laughs> 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 oh, is it an urban myth, or is there any truth in the fact that the arsonist will often come back to the scene of the fire and watch we have it burn? Had, yeah, we um, particularly. There's not a joke, particularly stupid ones will always come back and you'll see them standing there. They'll ask a load of questions. Quite often they'll be the ones that discovered the fire. Do you know, <laughs> it's usually the security guard or the caretaker. There you go. Heavens. Now, quite a lot, we've had quite a few security guards. I don't know if they get bored or they. they really <laughs> bored, they really. but it's not a joke, honestly. This is true. Over the years, I've had a fair number. There's nothing against security guards, but as a percentage, it's higher than the rest of the population. But yes, they do, quite often. Wow. A professional arsonist, arsonist will yeah. maybe stand well back to make sure it's gone off then leg it. But um, anyway, let's test your fire science. Interesting. Bit of paper. Now, remember what I said about air being entrained in? Okay, if I light this paper at the top, what's going to happen? Yeah. It could burn out, yeah. yeah. Go to the side. Very slowly. Very slowly, yeah. It could travel slow. It's going to be slow though, it may go out. Yeah, that's good. Now, if I was to light it at the bottom, what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to preheat the fuel above it, get it to it, and it's going to go a lot far. I mean, paper is actually very interesting stuff. If it's in a uh, big stack of newspapers, it's basically non combustible. The edge will char, but it won't burn. Mm. But if you get it nice and thin, well, we use it for lighting fires. And if you get a newspaper and roll it up and fold it over, it's you know, something we call a mill or brick, you can kill something. <laughs> 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 It's just a, you know, that's a, just a bit. So, but if I screw this up like you would when you, uh, when you ignite a, you know, a fire, an open fire, what's going to happen? Let's have a look. Oh, cool. Well, you never really know. That's why you need fire investigators, because you never know what's going to happen. So that's not happening for me. But um, let's, have, let's go on. Um, I wonder if we can see a bit of video. Yeah, before we, I'll train you a little bit more before we start asking questions. Let me show you um, what petrol can do. Sorry for the awkward silence, but my computer is so secure that I can't get into it. There we go. Now this is um, two guys in Germany. This is quite a famous bit of video really. And uh, what he's doing, he's splashing petrol onto a fire, they're farmers. And he just wants to get it going. Now if you notice around the edge of the fire, see this wall, this is like a bun wall. He's built that to protect the grass so it doesn't spread and lose his grazing field. But petrol vapor is heavier than air, so it's going to sit down low and it's going to stay. This is a trailer, yeah, that's his safety. He's made a little trailer away so he can get back to the night and die. And, uh, and the What's put a little bit more, make sure it's going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? He's got it. Yeah, that's it. But he's, he's laid his little trailer away so he's safe. He just leans back. <laughs> Oh, 
seven litres of petrol in the open air. Did they get away? Yeah, but what I'll do, I'll try and pause it where the flame goes red and we'll see how, how you can interact with fire without really even knowing. Um, let me see if I can I'll do my best to stop it on the right place. never like barbecues with petrol and if it does don't use it it's just too reactive too dangerous I know because uh, I got caught out when I was a kid right I'll try and catch him just as he's lit it and you should see the flame go uh, right around him and you see it's completely engulfed <laughs> I just missed that flame actually went right round him, it's now receding away from him. But as you can see all the front of him still in focus on him anyway. And that's, you know, how we're gonna catch people with the evidence still on them. So um, there is a serious side to this. That is good fun watching that. Um, I'll show you one more bit of video and then we'll crack Let me show you. As professionals, obviously, we, we don't get caught out with, um, with stuff like this because we're aware of the dangers. This is the uh, San Diego Lifeguards, and they, they do this every year. I hope not, they don't do it quite the same as this year, but um, they're carrying out training exercises for marine firefighting, and that's petrol. Now, imagine that boat again, it's like a bath, isn't it? And you know, petrol vapor, as we now know, is heavier than now, so it's going to sit down low. So, as he drops the torch down, and it goes into the Fangle Range. Oh, oh. Oh, if you listen carefully, you can hear his mates laughing in the back now. It's a good time. And he manages to get out of the So, you know, if any if firefighters can get caught, anyone can. So, petrol is extremely dangerous. Do not use it for anything like that. Put it on fires. If you want to use anything, get a bit of paraffin. Um, what was that? Video. A training exercise of some sort? Yeah, it was... Um, the fellow made a mistake in judging his distance from the fire or what? <laughs> he made a mistake in using petrol. <laughs> what he should have done, he should have mixed it with uh, maybe with ga with diesel, you know, make it not so reactive yeah. or use paraffin. He should never have used petrol because the vapor's heavy in there. It's sat in the bottom of that boat. Point, and as he's loaded, he's used far too much as well. Uh, it's just ridiculous. I've got loads of footage of people doing stupid stuff. Where firefighters in the States, they, uh, my mate was over there doing some experiments with them. And they were they, they allowed them to burn structures down for training. They put some petrol in and they delayed and they messed about. And by the time they came to ignite it, the petrol vapour, it all, it all turned into vapour. It was quite a warm day. Yeah. And the house got to what we call stoichiometric uh, ratio, the ideal mix of petrol and air. They ignited it and it blew the house to bits. Took down phone cables, took car windows out, house windows out. You know, they're just, uh, it's a different world, honestly. But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I would love to do it. But. <laughs> anyway, let's um, have a look at this photo. Can you all see that? <coughs> right, there's no abstaining. I need a show of hands. Who thinks this fire has been accelerated? Accelerant outside? So, do I assume the rest of you think it hasn't? Mm. Mm. I'm going to give you one more chance. Well, I thought maybe petrol would be There you go. Have you, have you done that sort of thing? <laughs> this, um, this is typical of a fire that we'll go to an accelerated fire. And um, unfortunately, in this case, for the arsonist, he got most of the ignitable liquid on the outside rather than the inside. So it wasn't very successful. But you have to ask yourself you know, there is no fuel to get that fire going. It's just the paint on the door. So to get that going, there must be something introduced. Now, we go to Lowe's where people put petrol through the letterbox, they ignite it, sometimes it gets away, sometimes it doesn't. The problem is with that, we look at it slightly different than the police. They have very different resources to us. But to us, if you put petrol through someone's letterbox, you're trying to kill them. 
because it's only through luck that they survive. It's like me pointing a gun and either missing or hitting when I pull the trigger. If I did that in a high street, there'd be police everywhere. If I go to some old lady's uh, no, mailbox, put petrol through, I'm lucky to get them to turn up. At least not till the next day, because their resources, they prioritise and they figure, because it's happened, she's now safe. But it's attempted murder. The difference is, there may have been a coat behind the door, there may not have been. And that's how people walk away. You know, it's as simple as that. We, we regularly get people killed by this. This happens all the time. Almost every night in London you'll get something like this. So you're saying quite often people don't put Oh, stacks. It's a, really? Yeah. For all different re reasons. There's um, obviously racist attacks, yeah, homophobic attacks, criminal attacks, mm. vengeance, threats, uh, disputes. You know, my mate went to a fatal um, and uh, it was the same thing, We've got a murder. it was a murder, petrol through the letterbox, old boy was dead, there had been a dispute over a guy putting rubbish bags out too early. <laughs> uh, the bloke who had done it was standing in the crowd. Uh, luckily the cop had him, it was a uh, CID car that turned up, he sent his police officer down the local petrol, petrol station straight away, they got the CCTV footage of this bloke, he walked back, saw him, there he is, they nicked him straight away, and he'd done it. But the interesting thing is, you know, think, that morning when that fellow got up, did he wake up thinking, I'm going to be a murderer today? Well, no, he didn't. But he's lost it, and he's ended up killing someone. Now, you know, and at what point in time did that, I don't know, you know, the human psychology is something else. But, but the more observant amongst you, let's get back on track. Um, if you look here, there's the container smashed through the window. So, um, if you'd have looked at the whole picture, you might have seen it. It was white spirits, by the way. But, um, yes, that's accelerated. Have a look at this. Um. Okay. Right. This is in uh, this is in Barking. Anyone from Barking? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Speak up, Anne. <laughs> interestingly, you're from Barking, yeah? A long time ago. Oh, inter interesting. Because in Barking, <laughs> this is a. Uh, <laughs> you just had that recovered, didn't you, Anne? <laughs> Still good. <laughs> <laughs> Very comfortable. I'll do the chunks. <laughs> this is a, um, a culturally acceptable um, activity that um, on certain occasions where there is a, a dispute, shall we say, of, regarding the parentage of the children, the man will typically smash the spiddles in the stairs and ignite the furniture in the front room. It's just a cultural thing, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but it's what they like to do. And, um, is this, who thinks this was accelerated? No, I don't think Is there anyone who thinks this was accelerated? I'd like to know what that is. Two brave people. <clears throat> Stupid but brave. No, <laughs> no the, the point is, this is very interesting because, can you see all the splash marks around yeah. here? Yeah. Now the guy who set this fire, he set the fire on a, um, his knowledge of fire science and fire dynamics was probably not, not that good, shall we say. I think it's fair to say he could have done with a little bit of reading. Because he set the fire on a fire retardant sofa. <laughs> And then he tried to accelerate the fire using cooking oil. Oh, now, heaven. if you were to think to yourself, if cooking oil was a good accelerant, we probably wouldn't cook with it. <laughs> <laughs> because every time you went near it, your pans would burst in the sun. It will burn if you get it hot enough, but you've got to warm it right up to like 450 degrees C plus to get it going. So, oh. It, it's an interesting one because although he didn't manage to accelerate it, the, the uh, intent was there. So that, this is a very unusual one, you know. Mm. If it was me, the defence I would come out with because I'm really good at coming out with defences. That's not what I'm going to do another time. <laughs> Work for the bad guys. I would say that I came in, discovered the fire, discovered my wife in the front room setting the fire, tried to stop her. Pushed her out of the way. All I could find was some cooking oil. I knew it didn't ignite until 450 degrees C. <laughs> I used it in an attempt to put the fire out. So I'd have got away with it. Oh, right, have a look at... Um, oh, it's where... Have a look at this. This is um, an incense burner. Okay. Um, this is a, like, pulled back a bit. There's the incense burner in the corner. 
And now if I'm in that room and I turn 180 degrees facing the other way, that's the fire looking that way, yeah? Cool. So I'll go back to the beginning again. Okay. Now anyone who doesn't get this right has to leave the room. Right? <laughs> and don't all try and get it wrong on purpose. <laughs> so who thinks that was accelerated? No, 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 this, this high level damage is just the, the heat layer descending, softens and melts plastic. We use that as an indicator for the temperature of the room and stuff. Does anyone think that was accelerated? What, is, it an, is that a sofa or something? That is a sofa, yeah. Okay. And that's a circa 1970s three sheet serving hatch in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm sure you've all got. <laughs> so, right, well, this fire was accelerated, but not by an ignitable liquid. I'll go and take you back. And the story was the lady who lived in there, there was, it was a, a one bedroom flat and there were seven people living there. She wanted to get rehoused. At the time of the fire, when I got there, I found a letter on the bed with her being turned down for being rehoused. And she obviously was a little bit distraught about this, so she decided to set light to the place. And what she did, which was quite clever, she draped the curtains into the incense burner to make it look like an accidental fire in an ignition source. And in all honesty, if that had got away and the room had done a flashover, I would have been hard pushed to call that deliberate because there's a good accidental ignition source there. But, again, she didn't read the label. And the curtains were fire retardant treated. So <laughs> now, if you look in the middle of the room, see this here? Huh? That's a mound of um, rugs, a bit of clothing, and some paper that's been made into a bonfire. So she's altered the layout of the fuel in the room in an attempt to accelerate to increase the growth, initiate or increase the growth of the spread and fire. Yeah? So that's an accelerated fire, but we call it a solid accelerant. Unusual for amateurs, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, People do use shredded paper and all kinds of stuff, you know, but it's an unusual thing to see. And here, what she did was, um, she trailed, this is bedding, she trailed a duvet up along and into the kitchen in an attempt to spread it into the kitchen. What you can't see from the photo is that she turned all the gas taps on as well, which was mm. nice for our guys when they put the door through and it'd be oh, eight cents. Of course, they can't smell. Luckily, it takes quite a long time for a, a compartment to fill up and reach its lower explosive limit with uh, natural gas. If it had done, and they'd put the door through and that had gone bang, it was on the third floor, they would undoubtedly have gone over the balcony and got on their BA set, so I'm probably going to kill them both. Gosh. So it took this one a little bit personal, really. Mm. Um, it's not uncommon, we come across it a lot, uh, gas tax put on. But, um, and it's not until someone like me or the incident commander goes in after the job they get the smoke <coughs> gas because they've got all their breathing mm. rates on. Mm -hmm. There's a block of flex, can't you turn the gas off before you go in? Um, depends where the meter is. Uh, sometimes what's in it, sometimes on the outside. And to be honest, sometimes there's so much going on mm. that mm. it's not always what you think about. Mm. Uh, in America, they have uh, quite a few things like the meters. You can take the fire and can disconnect the electric meter from the outside before they go in. Mm. Just the the same. Uh, um, we get, um, gas is funny, we get quite a lot of um, suicide attempts, you know, by people trying to set lights themselves and that. But um, with gas, the best place to be is by the ignition source and unluckily for them, or luckily, when they ignite the flame front it spreads away, it may damage the building, but quite often they're the only person left standing. And you know, looking around, they've tried to kill themselves and everything's gone down, they're standing there and they're thinking, well, I mean, I'm even that unlucky now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I know we've had that quite a few times, numerous occasions. I mean, to make light of, it, light of it, I have to really, because I'd, you'd be suicidal yourself if you yeah. saw this every day and didn't. It is serious and it does happen, but um, that's just a point of interest really, you know. No disrespect to anyone involved in anything like that. Right, this is the serious side of things, and this is how I actually go about an investigation. Now, this was a fatal fire, two children died. There's no pictures of bodies and stuff like this, but this is the reality of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not I don't want to be dramatic, it's not so much like the crews going in and the families and the relatives and the neighbours, you know, it's, it's awful for really. This is a typical two up, two down house in um, East London, terrace, I've been in thousands of these, I, can, I know the layout of my eyes shut, you know, but um, from the front, for me, there's some quite interesting data there. Um, see the ladder, scaffold ladder, that's not a fibre grade ladder, there's no scaffold. What's it doing there? We don't use other people's equipment. It's a bit of data. Maybe nothing to do with it, but I'm going to make a note of it. See the bottom window? If you look at the window frame, can you see how... Oh, I guess I've got a face up there. Yeah. See how it's melted at this level? 
Uh, it's aluminium, it melts at 660 degrees, so I know anything above that is above that temperature. So I know that room's probably achieved flash over for them. The fire spread up the outside. But if we go back, um, this window here has been broken and all the and forced open the glass is on the inside. Fire's breached up the outside and breached these windows. Uh, front door, we always look for entry points and stuff. There are no signs of forced entry and the front door was open on the right of the fire crews. And some of the occupants of the house were out of the house. Turn around looking up the hall. See this um, very clean demarcation line there? That's movement pattern. That's telling me the fire spread from this room on the left up the stairs and up, up into the upstairs landing. So that's a movement pattern. So I know at least the fire has occurred in that room and spread up. Potentially one, maybe more suits. There may be other fires in the building, but that's given me a bit of an indicator as to where to look. Straight through is the kitchen. <coughs> Typical um, kitchen. Um, nothing weird going on. All this is a consequence of firefighting action. That's possible to drop down because of water damage. Now I would, um, oh sorry, I'm getting speed up a bit, I'm running over. I would, um, you catch me looking through drawers and cupboards and stuff like that, and people wonder what the hell I'm doing. I'm just, we find some weird stuff. We found terrorist stuff, bomb making equipment, guns, drugs. But we also try and build up a picture of people's lives. What mm. they're doing, are they careless, do they smoke, do they feed the kids? Is there anything weird going on? Are they locking the kids in the rooms? So, I mean, we're always very conscious of social issues and stuff, and we turn up some very interesting stuff, because when we arrive, people aren't expecting us. You know, if you've got a social worker coming at four o'clock, you know they're coming. We turn, we come when people aren't expecting us, so we find all sorts. But I'm trying to build up a picture of their life. The guy I work with, he quite often likes to try the clothing on. And we'll <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he says he's trying to live, the, you know. <laughs> I think that's going too far. Uh, you know, guys got their methods, you know. It's always uh, the ladies' clothes, I don't know. <laughs> no, but we do, we do search in unusual places, and that's why. Um, back of the building, another ladder. That's not ours. What's it doing there? Patio door's broken, all the glass on the outside. This window, this has got a window completely missing. Um, and this, see this little cupboard? There's a break on there. Now it's not very scientific, it was clean, it looked fresh. I noted it down. It may be nothing, it might have happened a week ago, I don't know. But that's what I'm saying about data. Unless I get it, I can't analyse it, I can't decide if it's relevant. Right, the damaged patio doors, the frame was locked, glass broken. What happened was, I confirmed later, the plaster wall had swung down and smashed them open during firefight. So we've got secure premises at the back. Because I'm thinking of, you know, someone breaking in and torching the place, so I'm looking for an entry. Electrics, we always look at electrics. No, not always a cause, but um, they're good. They're a good indicator. They can cause fires, but they can also help us say where a fire started, where it first occurred, what was on, what was off. And uh, I'll give you an example where things can go wrong. Uh, my mate was at a trial at the old Bailey with a forensic science service investigator, and a guy had uh, set light to a place. He'd been caught with a bomb belt on, uh, making a bomb belt, and arson devices, and. Uh, <laughs> He was trying to claim the fire was accidental. <laughs> I know we had two seats, and you know it was just ridiculous. But the defence found a weakness in the prosecution case. They forensic science investigated, right? And that was so obviously arson that they made a very basic mistake, which is unusual for them. You know, very unusual. And they hadn't documented the electrics. So the defence barrister, have you? Did you look at the electrics? Yeah. Where? Where's your documentation? Where's the photos? What did you recall? I didn't. So this fire could have been electrical in origin. If anyone who'd been there, it's so ridiculous, but to a jury who's never been in the room, doesn't understand the fire, well, yeah, if they haven't looked at it, it could be. But luckily, the guy from my aunt, this is why we like to work as a team with the police forensics, he's an electrician, a lot of them have got other qualifications, and he had documented it, and he put his hand up in the back of the court and got the fire. I'm not saying the bloke would have got away with it, but it cast a doubt on the case. And luckily, as working as a team. Very unusual mistake for an investigator to make, but we all make them. So um, that's why we look at, we try and rule out every reasonable cause, apart from hopefully the one we find. You know, if we come up with two, then we're not really determined that far. That's the stairs. Moving up the stairs into the, oh, that's interesting. That's the bathroom. So this is the loft ladder. See all the smoke that's condensed on the tiles, but it's only the bottom of the ladder is burnt. So I'm wondering what it's, what it's doing in there, like that. But what's happening is our crews, after they're doing an overhaul, They've pulled the ladder out of the loft and used their own equipment because we don't like using other people's. And that was the bit that was sticking out of the loft, actually. So that's why it's like that. That's the bedroom where the two kids were found. Boy was found there. 
the little girl hiding it was under the bed. Um, kids tend to hide, run and hide, they'll go to their parents' room, they look for the security, you know. So we have to search in the most unusual places, in wardrobes, all kinds of stuff. But unfortunately for these two children, it's too late. Five-year-old boy, three-year-old girl. It was a pretty traumatic incident for the fellas um, because, uh, I mean, the, the guy who carried them both out, two kids the same age, and the thing that made it worse for them, at the bottom of the stairs, there was their little shoes. Mm -hmm. And that's what they do in his house. And he's always telling his kids to tidy him up. It worked, yeah, they did have some burns, but they were... Uh, would it be the smoke that you would die from? It depends. Do you know, in this case, it was probably... Oh, I don't like to say, they were probably alive at the time when they did get burnt, in all honesty, which is unusual. You know, this is not the stuff you probably want to hear, but um, you asked me so. Mm. But it was particularly traumatic for that guy, and uh, this is the only job I've ever had to do. I was searching the room, and I don't ask people to do stuff that I would do, and I found a little doll under the bed. It was the same as one my little girl gave me. I've got it, you know, a little dolly, and I just thought, I just had to walk out. Like, it makes me feel like at this point now, talking about it, I couldn't do search that room, so I had to get someone else to do it. <coughs> and in court, I had to read the firefight statement. Was, he couldn't give his evidence at Collins Court, he just couldn't fight it. It was a horrible job. But, um, this is where the fire spread into the room. See the clean burn, that's where the actual flame impingement has burnt the wallpaper off. So that's a movement pattern. So I know the fire hasn't started now, but I follow that back to the room of origin. Bedroom. That was on the left. The fire's burnt through the floor on the left-hand side. And also that small bedroom, the fire's burnt through the floor there as well. The window has been forced, and the bedroom door had been locked and forced from the inside. So now I'm trying to think, oh, God, what's going on here? This is what flashover does. Now, when a flashover occurs, it alters all the burn patterns I normally look at traditionally. It changes everything. It alters the game, you know, completely. It makes things a lot harder. And you really have to understand ventilation and fire dynamics. From going to uh, what could be fairly simple to determine where it's like. Now we're getting very complicated, very difficult, many scenarios. But um, this radiator, can you see there's a bulge on that radiator there? This is a combi boiler system, a pressurised heating system. And what can happen is where the fire attacks the radiator first or the longest time, if it doesn't leak, the pressure can overcome the structure of the metal where it's heating and bulge out. So that's an indicator for me. Something's going on at that end of the radiator. So that's quite interesting. The walls are clean because that's been a well ventilated fire and it's been a uh, flash over, so it's lots of flame. Soot burns at about, it's like uh, charcoal, about 800 degrees C. It needs a very high temperature. So when you see a sooty fire, there's been a lot of smoke but not a lot of flame. This has actually burned the soot back off the walls. Five megawatt fire, it's a big energetic fire. Plaster coming off the walls, you get all sorts of people telling you stuff about this. To be honest, it's all a load of rubbish, you can't really tell much. Other than if there's a bit of soot that came off early in the fire. Um, this is a recliner chair with some rolls of wallpaper down on it, but the fire damage was from the top down. So that's telling me it happened later in the fire. There's the remains of the door, and this is the remains of a settee. Now up this end, there's a little bit left. As we come towards the other end, where that bulge is in the radiator, radiator there's very little bit left. Metal, completely consumed, all the time consumed. That ceiling where it's been breached is above where that bulge of the radiator is, where the settee is missing. Um, that's just showing you that line on the stairs. Remember, we can see mm. from the hallway why it was clean. The fire's gone up, it's sort of curled round and just cut up and burnt through there. This is after the scene's been excavated. So we excavate the room, we take out all what we think's not relevant, and we try and reconstruct it. That's the remains of the settee there in the left hand corner. Ceiling fan, TV, wasn't plugged in, easy to rule out. There's the settee again. You see on the right hand side of that settee, there's nothing left. That's quite a good view. But in that corner, I see those two metallic items there, um, the frames of the little kids pushed on toys, yeah? And um, there's all sorts of effects on there. I won't go into because we're getting on time. If you've got any questions, please just ask. Um, when did, it, did this happen at night? No, this was uh, about uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Well. That's right above where all those other indicators are, and that's where it's into the two rooms above. So I know something's going on in that corner. Does anyone know what that is? Double socket out there, yeah. Um, but nothing's plugged into it. See how it's clean inside, not involved. You know, that's an effect of the fire, not a cause. There's the room, okay? I, this is my area of origin here. 
that's where the fire started. I've got no accidental ignition source. It's got to be human act. So I'm looking for maybe accelerant room. There weren't any. I'm looking for a fire setting for the kids. You know. Then we interview the the gran. At the time, we thought the kids were still alive. Uh, Gran's in the ambulance. She tells me what happened. She was in the kitchen. Mum's gone out. Five-year-old boys in the front room. Never located three-year-old. It's movements really. Fourteen-year-old stepsister is upstairs in the bar. Gran comes into this room and the little boy is in front of the settee and he's got something in his hand. She asks him what it is, throws it under the sofa, starts laughing. At that moment in time, the daughter upstairs, the 14 year old, calls her Gran up. She's cut her leg, shaving. Can she bring a plaster up? Nan goes upstairs, gives her the plaster, sits down. We had some very good times on this job and uh, it was about, I, I can't remember them, but we had some quite accurate times for one reason or another. And about four or five minutes later, they smelled smoke. Now, this is what Grant tells me. She comes downstairs into this room and sees a fire on this chair. She goes out, out to the front door, and there's a crowd gathered outside. She recognises someone as a neighbour and says, where's the children? He says, they're outside. She comes out. Now, there's a lot of reasons of that story. That account, sorry, is not viable. 14-year-old's upstairs in a bathroom. She goes to a bedroom. Unlocks the door because she keeps smoking materials in there, grabs her mobile phone, locks the door, goes back into the bathroom, phones the brigade. Conditions become untenable. She has to make an escape attempt out the window. She falls and hits that little shed. But she's in the back garden, still okay, on the phone to the fire brigade. People are attempting rec uh, rescues with those ladders via the front and back neighbours. Word gets round that the kids are in the back garden. This is all simultaneous, you know, the stories are happening at the same time. Some members of the public make some very brave attempts at rescue into the front of the building, using the scaffold ladder, break the window, force the door open, it's beaten back by the smoke and flames. And uh, by the week time we turn up, we it, time of call, we were there in less than five minutes, probably four minutes, twenty seconds, something like that. Yeah, it's probably too late by that time. But the guys get them out. And bearing in mind, they've got to fight their way in first. They can't even get in until they, they hit the stairs out, you know, and get out there. So when we start looking into it more, the, uh, the young lad, Philip, had a history of fire setting since the age of three. The wallpaper was from a previous fire he'd set, trapped his sister in the bedroom before. He'd done all kinds of crazy things at school, like flood the school by experiment. He was quite a bright lad. He liked to experiment, you know, and he'd, he'd done all, he could do loads of stuff, only taking plugs apart. He's a five year old, he knew how to get out of the house, he'd turn the gas rings on. But he had um, one of his frustrations, he had a bit of a, he wasn't intellectually bright, with, uh, academically bright, sorry. And, you know, that's fairly the such a typical thing as a fire set. So, you know, that's, that's sort of how I go about an investigation. That's the grim side of my job. Well, there's a lot of good times, and I love what I do. And I always look at it, once something like that's happened, I'm going to try and do the best I can for the victim and the families and try and stop helping someone else. So that's, you know, that's what we're about. And um, this is a little quote we like to put up. And this is what I was saying earlier. It's, um, it's a mistake of all new investigators. Don't try and theorise what's happened before you get the evidence. We're evidence led. Whatever kind of investigation you do, be evidence led. Mm -hmm. When you've got your evidence, let that lead you to the answer if you can. Otherwise, you'll do the cardinal mistake, you'll twist the facts to think what you think's happened. Any idea who said that? You. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish it was. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Well, um, to be honest, I mean, I've got loads of stuff I can show you, but I think you probably want to get away. Um, <coughs> so, if you want to see any more, you know, you can ask me back. Is that Sorry? Is that uh, yeah, there's a story behind that one, which I'm afraid I can't go into because it's rather embarrassing to me. <laughs> 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 to say that, uh, no, I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> we had a little accident that day. But there, this was the day we were doing, we had some burns days where we... Um, carry out some experiments. Um, one was um, a kid, uh, we've got these wooden dummies that a guy invented, uh, Woody Junior. It's like a kid with articulated joints and one of the fellas, what he did, he strapped meat to him and uh, put folks coming up fireworks night, put meat, uh, fireworks in his bag and pockets and that to see what kind of injuries the kid would sustain and 
we concluded that it's the safest place to carry is in your pockets in the bag, because you can come out of the industry at all. So carry fireworks in your pockets, it's fine. Well, yeah, a bizarre result from that, but we had all, we were also doing petrol bombs that day, and uh, that was my run, because I had a case where a guy alleged to have thrown a petrol bomb, I knew he hadn't, sorry, he alleged someone else had thrown a petrol bomb, I knew it couldn't have happened there, he said. And um, I made up about 60, well, petrol bombs for the long term, Molotov, Molotov, uh, Molotov cocktail was a proper name. Um, and um, of all different types, and uh, we were throwing them into this grenade shelter, seeing how they spread and how hard they are to break, and how difficult it is you can't throw them over an arm. And, and everyone was a bit sheepish at first, and it was pretty funny because they're all like seasoned investigators. No one wanted to go first. They said, Come on, mate, no, that's how you do it. <laughs> by the end, by the time we got to like up to the 40s, I couldn't stop them. It was like a crowd, they were mad. <laughs> they were flying, and they're going everywhere. And one of the guys said, Like, to his trousers, we're all okay with where we were Right, it was a great day. We do quite a lot of experiments. The truth is, you don't learn about fire till you start setting them. We set them out of controlled environments, you know, obviously, and uh, do what we can. But uh, it's the thing with fire investigators. When you get a room of fire investigators together and they have a few drinks, you start talking about it and you find out what they did when they were kids. And no, it's, you know, either side of the line, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 My first experience, my, my interest in fire, my fire science came from my dad. My dad was a police officer and... Um, he taught me how to light fires in the background, I was in the scouts. And I didn't realise that the science that was involved, he taught me about it needed air, how it would heat and rise upwards. And you know, I got my interest in there. And when I look back, when I did my degree and I started writing about how I lit up, and I went right back, I thought, my God, you know, it was really interesting fire back then. And then I remembered the, the action man, I did a six. <laughs> <laughs> I did an action man on a parachute, and what I did, I, uh, I put a uh, test tube of, well, it was methylated spirits down his jacket and I broke it and I set lights in and <laughs> it over the wall and did, did the screaming effects and all that just burning and I hid it under my bed because then I didn't know what to do. I had a few action men I thought, how am I going to mind like that? I hid him under, of course, not fair. The next day I was in my bed, but uh, well, I didn't make a jump. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my story. Anyone got any questions? Uh, well, I, that's, yeah, sorry. Well, do you know, um, the first thing is, when, when you see a body, it's, for me, it's, it's a, don't get me wrong, I don't like seeing bodies take no pleasure in it. If I never went to fight fire again, I'd be out of day in my life, but that's unrealistic. But when you see a body, it's no longer a person for me, they've gone. It sounds callous, but that's my evidence, and that's how I have to see it. I have to examine them, you know, I've got to get distance myself that that is a person anymore. I don't, don't treat them with lack of respect, but I have to, I'm working for the memory of the family of that person now, and I, that's how one way I look at it. Everyone's got their own sort of things. We come back and talk about it. We've got advisory and counselling service. They phone me up monthly. Everything okay, you know, do you want to talk? You know, they're there. I've not, I've not had to use them. If I did, I'll, I'm not one of them blokes, I'm too tough for that. I'll be straight in front of them. We talk to each other. Um, you know, we've always got other guys come out to help us. To be honest, I don't talk about it at home um, because I don't think my wife needs to know and me, little girl. I have told her a couple of things in the past, but talking is the main thing. And um, yeah, once someone's gone, you know, they're not there anymore, they're somewhere else. And that's how I view it, wherever they may be, depending on your views, you know. And I suppose that, do you know, the worst thing is, is um, turning up when people. Get their, not so much when someone's died, when their place is destroyed, you know, they're insured or like, no one's hurt. Uh, it's stuff like the photos and the memorabilia you can never replace. It might be an old lady. That's the photos of a family or someone that died before. That's all she's got left and that's destroyed. You got, and that is heart wrenching because mm. there's nothing I can do. And you just, at some point, you have to cut off and walk away. But we're usually the last people there. Well, it's, um, well, we all have our, you know, everyone has their, in their job, everyone has their issues, don't matter what you do, that's just what I do. I mean, I know we've got some doctors here at night, you know, imagine what they have to go through. Maybe we worked in the city, the stress and strains of every job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but seriously, the stress and strains of working something like that, I couldn't take that. I couldn't do that. That's not me. I couldn't be a paramedic. I just couldn't do it. So you all fit into your niche and you find what you can do. Yeah, not everyone can cope with it. 
it's something you have to learn about. It's not pleasant, and I still don't like it, but, um, you know, I, I, I get by. And, well, no, you don't have to. It's, you know, everyone has their room. Like I say, what they do. To be honest, the strain on a job like this is not me going in there after. It's the guys trying to get in there to get them out. I think the pressure. If there's someone in there still alive. But, you know, we, there's a very famous fire in the States where um, a number of firefighters died. And they lost two, they sent another two in to find them. They lost another two, they sent another two in. They lost another two, they sent another two in. It was the Hartford Service Fire. At that point, the incident commander said, I'm not sending anyone else in that fire to die. And the guys who were left wanted to kill him. They hated him for that. But he knew he was sending them to their deaths. And imagine having to make a decision like that. That's the hardest. But years, you know, months or years later, he was proved to be right. And everyone came around, they realised at the time. So pressure on the guys on the scene, you know. You imagine um, a car crash where you've got someone in there. They're screaming every time you go to touch them. They're screaming every bit you move. It's awful trying to get them out. I don't have to do that. I used to. I don't have to do that anymore. Mm. You, you pull up at a job and someone says, there's kids in there. Well, if that building's burning down, I could stand in the way like that. Like, I'm never going to stop them. They're just going to walk over me. And I literally, I've tried in the past. They know it's pointless. But I cannot stop them blokes going in. Because the minute you mention kids, that's it. There's a different ball game. They don't care what's going to happen to them. They just... Mate of mine was seriously burnt at a fire in Stratford. He had full thickness burns, both wrists, his necks, his ears. You know, I believe there was kids in there. He went up the ladder, he got into the room, got onto the floor, he couldn't get any further. As he, he was in there a matter of, I don't know, 20 seconds before the other bloke had even got up the ladder. As he came down, he's a light. You know, and they're putting him out. He didn't realise they're putting him out because you're so pumped out of adrenaline. So, mm. you know, they're the fellas who face the pressure, not me. Mm. Mine, I'm in no rush. So, uh, you know, if anyone, that's sort of what I'd like you to remember, really, about the, you hear lots of battles in the press and all sorts of stuff, but they're really good fellas, you know, and uh, what they do is unbelievable. So, yeah, that's what I'd like to get across, really. But, any other questions? Right, any, any more questions? Yeah, apart from uh, crawling along the floor, on which you know is good, what other things would you do if you were in a situation where you, you had to try and go and rescue somebody? What oh, time? It's, it's so difficult for us because um, <coughs> typically old school firefighters, we didn't have any smokers, we had our old cork helmets and no gloves and plastic trousers. <coughs> but when you went into a fire, you could feel the heat and immediately you'd crouch down. It was automatic, so you'd get down on the floor and you'd go in, you'd crawl about, hold your breath if you, they was putting the sets on, you'd do stupid things. But now with all our gear, we're very protected. The problem is we're cut off, we're very isolated from our environment. So you're now going into situations that by the time you feel hot, it's too late, you're burnt. Because the radiant heat is travelling through your fire gear and you're boiling the bag. We're, we're midway between technology, we're too protected. We have no way of uh, telling our outside environment, but they don't want us to go in and get burnt for no reason. But for rescuing, I mean, there's no other way, we've got to get in there, that's it. And that's the bottom line, one way or another, we're going in and they're going to get them out. But crawling along has changed mm. because of, there's I'm so really, many... really asking you about... Uh, somebody other than a fire. Ah, right, well. Wet towels at the bottom of the door. If you're in a property, really you should protect yourselves. Oh, smoke alarms. Everyone here got working smoke alarms. If you haven't, for God's sake, go to your local fire station and tell them they'll come around and put them up for nothing. Okay? You must have them. Uh, get them to come around and check your house out. It's free of charge. They'll give you a home fire safety check. They'll make sure everything's all right. Uh, I'm sure. Sorry, what, what's your name? Dave at the back, he'll know the numbers to call for anyone who lives in Essex. They'll come around and make sure you're safe. Please do that. You should have an escape plan. What to do in the event of a fire, especially if you've got kids. Imagine if there's a fire at your front door. How are you going to get out? What if it's at the top of the stairs? What way are you going to go? Where are you going to try and get out? What are you going to do? Yeah, if you're trapped in a room, towels under the door. Lean out the window, shout for help, drop mattresses out. If you've got to, hang out, drop down. You know, it's all common sense, but you must be aware... People who think it's never going to act to them, they're the people who end up, you know, in a mortuary and slap, I'm afraid. And that's the blunt truth. So you need to have a plan. You need to keep yourself safe. Don't use candles. We have more candle fires now than they did in Victorian days when they didn't have electric lighting. Okay? But they knew what to do with them. They didn't have all the fancy candles. They, they clipped the wicks. They looked after them properly. So don't use candles. Don't smoke. Smoking's <laughs> dangerous, you know, in both ways. Any more questions for that? Can I just ask on a lighter note, do yeah. you really write your name on your plate when you go on a shower? 
Oh, do you know what the ch <laughs> sun? No, they know where they sit. But, um, oh, okay. Some of the blokes take it with them and eat it on the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's been useful. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you very much. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's also me, Mark, to offer a vote of thanks on behalf of everybody here this evening. Thanks so I much. think you've demonstrated to us all your commitment and your knowledge. I mean, obviously, you started off as an ordinary far off so Yeah, I never like to say that, case the guys you, get. You've come up to obviously a very high level of investigation. Thanks very much. Um, I think we're all truly impressed. I certainly am with, you know, oh, with your you. knowledge, mm. your commitment, mm. and your understanding, your psychology, really. I mean, it's a, a lot of that involved. It's not just. Yeah. Uh, you know, Keeps you interested. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'm, I'm sure everybody agreed it was a magnificent presentation. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I'm sure you all enjoyed so you thanking oh, very much indeed for coming on this evening. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. If anyone wants to start anything else, while I'm packing up, please come over and have a chat. Right, we're all on the meeting up now. Thank um, you very much. There's no other business to ask. <laughs>